All right. Good morning, New Life. It's good to be back with you today, and good morning to everyone who's joining us online as well. Uh, my name is Pastor Robin. I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, and uh, it's a delight to share the word of the Lord with you today. Uh, it, it is a blessing to sleep, amen? Yes. Amen! Especially to those who can't get a lot of sleep, right? It's a blessing to sleep. It's a good thing, you know. It's a gift from God to have a pause in your consciousness where you can rest and leave yesterday in yesterday and start over again with today and in the future. It's a blessing from God that we actually have that opportunity to stop. Because what would happen if we didn't? Well, we would bring all the anxieties, all the worries, all the to-dos of yesterday into today or tomorrow when you wake up. As a matter of fact, some of us do that anyway, right? You wake up first thing in the morning, what comes to mind? Oh, what did I get done yesterday? Did I get everything done? What needs to be done today? What so-and-so did to me yesterday? What so-and-so didn't do for me yesterday? What I did to someone? What I didn't do for someone? All those things, we're already thinking about them and they're coming back to our minds. We're bringing them into today. And those things can rob us of peace. I mean, even if you're here today, and you woke up this morning, beautiful, sunny, spring, May morning, and you had no thoughts of what to do or thoughts that were robbing you of peace, you could still, if you were putting all of your confidence in your circumstances, you could still be like, well, something bad's gonna happen tomorrow, right? And have you ever been that person where everything is good and all of a sudden you're like, wait, things are too good. Some, things are too good. Something bad is on the way. And that is simply a symptom of us putting confidence in our circumstances, confidence in our happenings, confidence in what we can see. When we do that, what's happening? We are setting our own standard for what peace looks like. Think about it. What's your standard of peace? Whatever your standard of peace is this. If this goes right in my life, then I'll have peace. If this individual leaves my workplace, then I'll have peace. Right? If this child starts behaving, then I'll have peace. If my husband starts behaving, I'll have peace. It goes the other way too, ladies, okay? Right? Because you're thinking about... <laughs> that was a setup. You guys are going to make this intro a lot longer than it has to be. All right, whatever that is, is your own standard of peace. And the unfortunate thing is that when we set our own standard of peace, we're setting a foundation on sand. We're setting a standard that is movable and shakable and weak, the puff of air. When God has his own promise of peace towards us, that he keeps he keeps his promise of peace towards each and every one of us. And his promise of peace surpasses all understanding. And it is immovable. It is eternal. And it is dependable. But we find ourselves shaken. We find ourselves even not able to sleep because of the anxieties of yesterday that we brought, we're bringing into today. We can't even sleep because they're troubling us so much. So the question is today, do you trust God's promise of peace to you? Are you trusting God's promise of peace to you? Or have you set your own standard of peace that you're trying to achieve on your own? I want you to hear what God's promise of peace to you looks like. It's right here in Luke chapter 1, verses 78 to 79. Um, God says this, because of the tender mercy of our God, it says, or myself, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. How many of us are dealing with anxiety that is so great 
that it feels like you're sitting in darkness, that you're in the shadow of death, where you just need that glimmer of hope for the clouds to break just a little bit, for a little bit of summer sun to shine on you, to give you hope for today. God says, I have a promise to guide you into the way of peace. And no matter where we are in that journey, in that spectrum, we can experience that today. It's what I want us to learn from today in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 80. So I want you to turn there with me. It's Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 80. If you've got your mobile devices with you, you can tr- look, uh, scroll to that area. And while you're doing that, this is what I want us to learn about today. That God keeps his promise for peace to us through deliverance, through forgiveness, and through care. And then when we put our confidence in that peace, that supernatural peace, it changes things. It gives us the ability to endure what we're going through right now because it's not circumstantial temporal peace. It's the real thing. Let's pray together and then we'll look at that together, okay? So um, let me just talk to Jesus. Jesus, your beauty is present today in the music more than the words, more than the sounds and all that different stuff. You have captured our hearts and that's why we're here. That's why we're raising our hands. That's why we're shouting because you've revealed to us your beauty. And so your beauty compels us to worship. So I, I pray this morning, Jesus, that nothing would get in the way of how we see you, that we would see you so well. I pray against every scheme of the enemy. I pray against the lies of the flesh. I pray against the evaluations of the world. Cancel them all right now in Jesus' name, that we would hear from you and see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this is what the first thing I want us to grasp from this uh, chapter is that God keeps his promise of peace through deliverance. We're going to be reading Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 75. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our fathers, to our father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. You know, um, this is Zechariah who's giving this. Zechariah was a priest. His wife, Elizabeth, was barren. She wasn't able to have children. An angel visited her and said, you're going to have kids. You have a kid. And this kid is going to be the greatest prophet of the old covenant because he is going to introduce the Messiah, the savior of the world. He is going to be the forerunner to this individual. We have prophesied about him. He's been prophesied about. You are the one who's going to have this kid. Now, Zechariah hears this. He doesn't believe it. So God says, okay, I'll take away your ability to speak. So he's not able to speak. And then all of a sudden, what we see here uh, just before this prophecy is that the, the child is born. They ask Zechariah, what are you going to name the kid? Just name him after yourself. Zechariah's like, no, no, no. The angel said it was John. The guy starts speaking. Everyone's amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, he was deaf. He was deaf. He was mute. And now he could speak. So it's a great sign to all of them. And in this moment, Zechariah is, don't miss this, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's so filled with the Holy Spirit that he writes a poem. Catch that. I know sometimes in the church we either um, uh, elevate the arts too much or we dismiss them too much. But you get this. God fills them with the Holy Spirit and then he writes out a poem. This, This priest, this Jewish priest who knows the Hebrew Proverbs and Psalms probably back and forth, he says this most beautiful prophecy, but in a poem. And the poem is so beautiful because it hints and highlights things to us, to those who know how to read them adequately, the things 
that God wants to reveal about himself. This is such a powerful prophecy because basically I want you to imagine this. We are sitting here in our corner of the universe here on the planet Earth and we're right beside Venus and Mercury and the sun. Well, guess what? There's lots of suns all over the universe and what happens is is that God does this with this prophecy. He goes all the way past Jupiter, Neptune, and all those other ones that I can't name and he goes all the way to the other side of the galaxy and the universe and he grabs a zipper and then he opens it up all the way back to our part of the universe and says look at the inner workings of the entire universe I want to reveal to you my majestic plan to keep my promise of peace to my people and it's this person of Jesus Christ and he's showing up He's the one. Now, what do we realize here in these words? We realize that there's a conversation about deliverance and deliverance from enemies. Now, the people of Israel who are hearing Zechariah say this are now captured, right? Because they are dealing with some enemies because they are under oppression from the Romans, And the Jewish people actually have a history of being oppressed by other nations. They come out of Israel and they're getting, and they're going into the promised land. Well, they take over the promised land. Now they're getting oppressed by the Midianites and the Amalekites and all these other surrounding nations. And they fail at being able to get rid of these folks. They get their own kingdom and then other nations come and start taking over that kingdom. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, they take them out, they put them in exile, they come back, they get taken over by the Greeks and guess what? The Greeks were bad, but the Romans were even worse. And now the Romans have come and taken over and they're like, where is God's promise of peace? Because we are surrounded by every side by our enemies completely surrounded. I want you to catch how how they might hear this, how the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, this is a prophecy of this king, this majestic king who's going to come and wipe out all of their enemies, who was promised within the covenant and the oath to Abraham. I want you to look at that right now, that, that covenant from Abraham. It's in um, actually, matter of fact, I don't have it written down, so I won't turn to it. Um, but there's a promise that in, in the promise of Abraham was that God was going to wipe out all the enemies of his people. He's going to give um, Abraham and his descendants the gates of his enemies. So they're hearing this and they're like, yes, you're going to get rid of all of our enemies. That is fantastic. They can look at it within their circumstances. But even if you look a little bit deeper, because we're talking about the person of Jesus, if you consider this, that even 70 years later from this point, the people of uh, Israel and the city of Jerusalem is overcome by the Romans. The Romans are so fed up with the Jewish people and their revolts that they destroy Jerusalem. They overturn the temple and they burn it down. So the people here can look at this prophecy and be like, what, what is going on? Isn't he supposed to be taking care of our present circumstances? God's kind of disappointing, isn't he? But let's look a little bit deeper right now at verse 77, because verse 77, you look a little bit farther, we see what the definition of this salvation, this deliverance is. In this conversation about who John the Baptist will, who is and what he will do, it says, that John the Baptist will give knowledge of salvation to his people in the what? In the forgiveness of their sins. So we're not just talking about a temporal little subjective point in history. We again are looking at the pulling back of all temporal time and space to see what God wants to do. God wants to take care of the ultimate enemy, the real enemy, not just the symptoms God wants to deal with the root problem. And what's the root problem? It's sin. And the people of Israel should know this because God said it in Deuteronomy. He said, like, if you don't follow my ways, what's going to happen? Nation after nation is going to take you over. And he gives a list of all the bad things they will do. And all these things have happened and will continue to happen. So he's saying, no, 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 no. Let's deal with the root problem. The root problem is sin. 
Let's deal with the real enemies of humanity, the real enemies of the church. This is every movie where the police guys are like, all right, we're going to go in there. We're going to take care of the mob bosses. And they go and they take care of the mob bosses. And then they realize, oh, no, the mob bosses, mob bosses were being supported financially by an offshore, you know, um, a government, non-government organization that was sponsoring them. And we thought we were getting rid of the snake, but we were just chasing our tails. We thought we were taking the head off the snake, but we didn't even get to the root of the problem. This is when you get an ankle injury. You get an ankle injury, and it doesn't repair properly because you didn't go to physio. And so what happens is, is you walk around on this for a while, and then your muscles start compensating for that injury. And they start compensating in such a way that it starts to hurt your back. And your back hurts, and you're like, oh, I need some Motrin. I need some Advil, right? And you start popping these pills to deal with the back pain, but guess what? Now these pills are damaging your liver. And all this time you find out in the end, when you finally go to physio, oh, you know why your back hurts? It's because of that ankle injury that you had back in, you know, grade 10, that you never really dealt with properly. So now you have to train your muscles to deal with the inconsistencies. You have to deal with the root issue and not with the symptoms. You know, a lot of us are looking at our circumstances, we're looking at our enemies. We're looking at what we could see in front of us and we're saying, this is the problem. If I get rid of this person, if I get rid of this financial situation, if I get rid of you, just name it anything, then I'll be fine. And God says, no, 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 no. My promise for peace comes first in which way? In the way that I'm going to give you deliverance from the real enemies. Because no matter what, you'll just be dealing with the symptoms if you don't deal with the real enemies. And Jesus dealt with them on the cross. Who are the enemies of the church? Who are the enemies of humanity? First and foremost, Satan, right? And his demonic forces. How he wants to oppress and distract the church. Then we have the flesh. We have indwelling sin in our bones, in our DNA, lying to us, trying to lead us to death. Then we have the world, this paradigm, this system, this way of thinking that is existing in all of creation that is against God, that is independent of God's way. It's basically the way of death and the way of unrest rather than the way of peace. These three things are out there. We endure them. We struggle through them. We feel them. We wake up in the morning and see them at work and are consumed by the worries of everything that they bring. And Jesus says this, but in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, he said, I have come to destroy. Say destroy. destroy. Come to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, he says, I have crucified. Say crucified. You have crucified the flesh in your bodies. What does that mean? It means I've taken away the power of indwelling sin. I've taken away the power of it. You do not have to submit to the voice of temptation anymore. You are free from that. You can choose to listen to God's spirit now. And then in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says this, take heart because I have overcome the world. He's overcome the world. He has come. It is the victory of the cross that these three have been defeated. And when we rest in them and we trust in Jesus and his original victory, what begins to happen? We can do what verse 74 says. I want you to look at verse 74 really quickly, okay? So we want you to look back there. Luke chapter 1 verse 74 that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him, Jesus, without fear. Some translations say without anxiety. We could finally serve him, follow his way, do what he asks us to do without fear. Because what? We're putting our confidence in Jesus and his ability to defeat our enemies and not in our ability to fix our problems. We realize that he has done that ultimate work. It happened on the cross by which when Jesus died and you begin 
You chose to trust in him, believe in him, that the part of you, your spirit that animates your body that could not follow God, it got crucified with Jesus. And when Jesus rose to new life and you chose to believe in him, Romans 6 says that when he came to new life, he also gave us the ability when we believe in him to receive new life from him. So now we have a new spirit that does follow God, that does trust him, that does love him. And we have a want to, where we want to follow in his way. So we don't have to be subjected to the real enemies that want to take away your rest. They want to take away your peace. They want to distract you from the way of peace. So Jesus keeps his promise. God keeps his promise of peace through what first? Through deliverance. Now, that's really great and good, but we also have experienced a lot of hurt from the world. Um, we've, we've experienced struggling through the lies of the flesh, lies of the flesh that would tell you that you are what you do, that you are a shameful person because you did a shameful thing. We struggle through these things. We struggle with the evaluations of the world that you aren't good until you look like so-and-so, until you are this weight, until you have this amount of money in your bank account, until you have this position and job, until you get into this school, until you have this success in your art. We deal with those, and we deal with the hurt of wrestling with those three things. So we have to learn how to forgive at times. And that's the next thing that God's peace does. See, God keeps his promise of peace through forgiveness. So let's take a look at that. It's Luke chapter one, verses 76, and then 78a, right? Let's look at that together. So keep looking here, we're at verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. And we're going to stop there. Now we're talking about John. And next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about John. Today, this week, we're just looking at one part of his life, the first part of his life, one eventful part of it. And then we're going to be looking next week at the end of his life, an eventful part at there. And we're going to be looking at Jesus revealed through that. And here we could see what we learn about John is that he is the great prophet. Malachi chapter four, uh, sorry, Malachi chapter three, it talked about him, referred to him, that he was going to be the Elijah. He was going to be the person who was going to introduce Jesus. And he was going to be the prophet of the most high God and go before the Lord to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Now, I could say that God keeps his promise of peace through forgiveness, but you'd be wondering, well, Robin, where do you get that from right here? Well, first and foremost, the people of Israel needed to come to an understanding at this point in time of the real enemy. The real enemy was sin. We, we took a look at that. But what they also needed to realize is the depth of what forgiveness can do for them and how it ensures peace for them. And how, guys, forgiveness ensures peace for us. I want you to look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So we have been justified by faith. What does that mean? We've been made righteous by trusting in God's rescue for us in the cross. Trusting that we have been made righteous. We have been justified. We are loved by God. It is not about what we do, but it's about what Christ has done for us. And that gives us peace. This wonderful, wonderful thing that we have with God, but that we can also have with others. You see, the people of Israel would have understood, just like we were talking about before, that forgiveness was something that does give them rescue. Turning back to God would give them rescue from their enemies. But it's the same truth for us, that bitterness and unforgiveness towards either ourselves or others robs us of peace. And you know it's true. 
So what did Jesus do? Jesus came and he said, I'm going to be the judge. I'm going to be the prosecutor and the jury for yourself, which some of us can receive easily, but also for those who've harmed you. You don't need to bear the weight of being all three of those things. What does that look like? It could look very simply like this. It could look as simple as, I was offended by something that somebody said to me in church. It was just in passing. I was, I was walking on my way. They said something to me. They addressed me just very plainly, very lightly. They said something that hurt me. And when they did that, I, 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 I went home. I was thinking about it. I was mulling it over every day, every day this week. I was waking up thinking about it. I was so troubled by it. It was, man, and you sort of get angry. And then you want to go and say, well, maybe I need to go against, I need to go to this person and correct them. Maybe I need to, 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 to show them that they did something wrong. And instead, what you could do is this. You can go to the person of Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, what that person said or did, it robbed me of peace. It robbed me of a sense of security. It robbed me of a sense of belonging. It robbed me of a sense of okayness but I know that you restore. So I'm coming to you and I'm instead of going after them to repay what was taken, I instead trust you to do that. And I release the right to retribution against those individuals. I instead allow you to be who you are, which is the judge, prosecutor, and jury. I release the authority to judge to you. And instead, I come to you and I ask you to restore what was taken. What happens in that moment? You might still have the memory of the thing that hurt you. But you might experience peace. And why? Why would you experience peace? You experience peace because the weight of having to change someone's mindset about what they did to harm you. The weight of having to convince someone that they would hurt you the weight of trying to get back what was taken from you has now been lifted and you've given it over to Jesus. And you could do like what Paul says, very plainly. Don't be quick to get revenge on folks. You know, trust that God says vengeance is mine. It's mine first. Now, this is not what I'm saying. What I'm not saying is that anytime there is an opportunity for legal or criminal action that we just back away from that. If that applies, do it. But even if that happens, even if something criminal happens, there need to be a criminal recompense or legal recompense. That could still happen. You could get everything back. Maybe you get your money back. Maybe the person goes to jail or whatever, but you could still be carrying the pain of what happened and the weight and the hurt of what happened to you. And you could still be robbed of peace every day and every night thinking about what happened, instead of releasing the weight of authority to Jesus, trusting him to manage the hurt, trusting him to heal, trusting him to restore, and allowing him to do that. You know what? Um, I want to give you a very, very simple idea um, or example of this. You know, um, my wife Deanne tells a story about how she was in transition between youth pastors when she was a youth leader. And their former youth pastor had been there for a while. They had left. So the youth leaders were kind of taking over the youth ministry for a few, for a few months. And then in September, the new youth pastor came. And she would tell the story, the new youth pastor came in and he knew what he was doing because he had been a youth pastor before. And he came in on that first night of youth and just took authority over the whole, like over a, over a game. It was just giving directions and telling people what to do and showing them where to go and so on and so on. And the game went really well. And she says, it was such a relief to herself and the other youth leaders to have someone else who has authority to come in and take the weight of authority away from them so that the youth leaders can go back to just being the youth leaders and enjoying being with the kids and being a support. Guys, sometimes we're carrying around the authority to judge, to prosecute others. And it's a heavy weight and it robs us of peace. 
And if we're able to release that authority back to Jesus, because it's his, that we can experience a renewed sense of peace. And God keeps his promise of peace through forgiveness. He keeps it. It's one way that we could step into understanding what we're going to learn about next, what it is to walk in the way of peace. Listen, guys, I'm talking to you about stuff, and I know that some of us here are carrying weights of hurt that I can't even fully understand. I'm carrying weights of hurt that you couldn't fully understand. But do you know who understands? Jesus. He knows the depths to which you've been hurt that you haven't even taken responsibility for, that you can't even understand. He knows. And he will restore faithfully, even in ways that you weren't even prepared. You don't even have the understanding by which, because he knows everything. And if we are confident enough to release things to him, we will find renewed peace. But beyond that, you might be here today and say, Raman, that's really great. Thanks for giving me that instruction, those illustrations. Fantastic. But right now in this moment, the memory of my own failings and other people's failings, the failings of the world, they're giving me a lot of discomfort. Matter of fact, I am actually one of those people who can't sleep because of the anxious thoughts. Or I'm one of those people who woke up with no anxious thoughts, but I'm, I'm, I'm future tripping. I'm thinking about the future and all the bad things that could come. And I'm worried about that. Where's the hope? Let's keep reading. God keeps his promise of peace by caring for us. It's Luke chapter one, verses 78 to 80. Let's look at this together. So we're going back and it says, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And reading a little bit further on, and the child, not talking about John, grew and became strong in the spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Quick pause, I'm adding verse 80 in there because what you can see is at the top of this prophecy in verse 67 where we started with, we realized it started with the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that came upon Zechariah by which he began to prophesy. Now we see at the end of this, before we get into chapter two, that it's the Spirit that is now empowering John to usher in the person of Jesus. He that began a good work in you, you can be confident that he will bring it to completion. The Spirit is involved. God's Spirit has come to journey with you, within you through everything that you were experiencing from beginning to end, just even in the way that God mercifully orchestrated these verses and these words together, we can see that this is a beginning work with Jesus and an ending work with Jesus. We can put confidence in the one who's the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm getting excited. Let's get back to this verse. Okay. So if you look at verse 78 here, it says the word tender mercy. Uh, the, the Greek word here is actually the word bowels. Uh, they use the word bowels um, in, a, in a romantic and a dramatic way to say that it's from the deepest part of somebody. It's from the deepest, most um, uh, emphatic example of the deepest emotional center of a person. And so they couldn't say bowels, so they said tender mercy of our gods. Right, because it just wouldn't make sense to us. But it's showing that God's mercy towards you, God's mercy towards Eleanor and to Sean, God's mercy is so deep. From the deepest recesses of his being, he has compassion for you in whatever you have faced, in whatever journey that you are in, in whichever way that you need peace. He has such a deep compassion and love for you. So much so that this happens, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. 
This is a this goes right back to the last word that the that last word of the prophets given to the people of Israel back in Malachi chapter four. You you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. Malachi chapter four says this about Jesus. But for you who fear my name, the Son S U N of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. This is a throwback to a sunrise, the, the, the imagery of being in the dark, but then the sun rises and there's a new opportunity of hope. Now think about this. In Bible times, agrarian society, there's no electricity out there, right? There's no lampposts that as soon as, as soon as it gets dark, the lights come on, right? It's dark all the time. Being in the nighttime could actually be extremely terrifying. Imagine not having all of the conveniences that we have when it comes to light. And imagine living in the darkness and the hope that a sunrise would bring. This is the picture that, that is trying to be drawn to the people of Israel, but then to us today. The sunrise shall visit us. One last thing, okay? This word visit is not just to visit. It's also the term meaning a, a visit of care. It gives you the picture of a pastoral visit. The picture of somebody coming who has authority to serve you, authority to care for you, who has the ability to bind up your wounds, has come to visit and give you care. It gives you the picture of a, of a, doc, a doctor's visit, right? Those used to happen back in the days. This is the type of visit here. It's an idea that the sunrise will come and not just shine brightly, but will visit you. And this is a throwback right to uh, verse 68 where it says, this, God, this, this, this son of righteousness, this Jesus, this Messiah will visit us. This exact same verse, same, exact same verb, mind you. An idea of care. And to do what? To give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of Peace. I want to give you a picture of this while we close. You know, uh, um, my life is so exciting. The two most harrowing things in my life are parenting and camping. <laughs> and they both go together. Okay? I live a very exciting life. And uh, we were camping, and I had the garbage. You know, you get out of the garbage, you put in the garbage bag. And then they have like the big bin that's like at the end of like the campsite. Or if you're lucky, you've got a campsite that's near the big bin. So you don't have to walk a large uh, distance to go there. Or you can just throw your garbage in the bag and throw it in your trunk and then drive down and put it in there. Well, I'm feeling like Mr. Brave this time. And I'm like, you know what? It's the dark of night. I'm going to throw this garbage out while we're all going to bed because it's just sitting around. And we don't want the raccoons to get in it. Well... Here I am, I'm walking down the path to this garbage bin, and it's a good bit away, and I'm thinking, well, on the map, it looked close. <laughs> it wasn't close, guys. It was just like a 15-minute walk. And for me, with the garbage, and I'm like dragging the bacon grease behind me, right? I'm just going, like, I'm like, now I'm attracting raccoons. So I'm walking down this path, and you're walking by people with their, with their generators and their big lights. Like, and I'm like, I'm getting down, getting down. And now I start to get past some of the generators, getting past some of the lights. And I realize, oh, I didn't bring a flashlight. I'm like, I'm sure I know where this garbage is. I'm pretty sure I saw it when we drove in. I'm just going to keep walking. And I keep walking and walking. And it's getting darker and darker. And now it's really dark. I'm like, man, where, where, are, where are them campsites? Now, now every little sound scares you. You know what I'm talking about? Right? You're just like, oh, is that over there? Is that a coyote? So I'm just walking, walking. It is pitch dark. Now I'm looking around for this garbage. I can't even see the garbage bin. I can't see my hand in front of my face. All I can smell is the garbage that I'm carrying. And I'm like, this is terrible. What if there's like a raccoon in the garbage bin or something? You know what I did? Honestly, this is not a, this, this is not a brave story. I walked back. I was like, I don't know where it is. I need a flashlight. I walk back. I got all the way back to the campsite. And then I'm like, I'm not going to. And then when I get back to campsite, I'm like, I'm not going back there. I just threw all the garbage in the trunk. I was like, I've had enough. Locked it up. I was like, okay, tomorrow morning when it's light, I'm going to go and see it. I find out where it is, and then I'm going to throw out the garbage. 
some of us today are walking in journeys of life, with lots of anxiety, lots of worry, to the point that it feels like you're in darkness and you can't see your hand in front of your face. And even getting up in the morning is a concern because you don't know what today's going to bring. And it's so overwhelming that you feel like giving up. Just bring the trash that you're carrying into today just back home with you. But God promised that he's going to visit you. There is no action item. There's no application for you today other than this. That you might be carrying the weight of garbage, of pain that you've done, or other people have done to you. Even the pain of things that come in the future. And you're thinking to yourself, I can't do this anymore. But God keeps his promise to visit you. The sun will rise. That's why there was a picture of a sunrise. Why? Because the sun always rises. Even in the dark, you can trust that it's coming. Midnight is when the day begins. Sun is coming. And I know that today that you might have accepted his deliverance from your real enemies as an example of peace. Today, you may have accepted his forgiveness, the forgiveness of others, forgiving of others, and forgiving of yourself as peace. But you might be sitting here today with that garbage thinking, oh my goodness, when will the sun rise? It will, and it does. And he is faithful to visit you. I want you to look at Psalm 84. Okay, Psalm 84, you don't, you, um, it's going to be on the screen for you. Um, for the Lord God is a sun, S-U-N, and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Who walks uprightly? We do. Why? Because we have been made righteous. The word uprightly can be translated righteous. You've been made righteous. God won't withhold any good thing from you. I know right now it doesn't feel like it could not, it could possibly not feel like he does that. But the sun will rise. He is a sun and a shield. Why a sun? Of course, because the, the impending darkness of night could be a great terror. But we need to be reminded of his faithfulness to visit us. Before we close, I want to leave us with this. That even though God keeps his promise here in, the, in this prophecy of, of peace and deliverance and forgiveness and care, you know what? God keeps his promise of peace through you. Because God will visit in his own miraculous way and timing to care for you and to give you light in the dark. Maybe it's just a word. Maybe it's a picture. Or maybe, it's, um, maybe it's a Bible verse that just gives you you know, encouraged to make it through today. He will visit you and do that. But you know what? He also works in and through us. And you don't know today, when you leave this place, how you might be God's promise of peace to someone else. That he might use you to visit and care for someone else. So I want to implore you today, among everything that we've learned about, about God's promise to keep the peace. Um, keep his promise of peace. That he lives and abides within you. That Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's the hope of glory for you, but it could be the hope of glory for someone else. And when we're willing to follow him and his leading into whatever he's called to do in serving others, we have the opportunity to reveal to others that God does keep his promise of peace. And it could be through something so simple. Even just think about that, that, that picture, that analogy I gave, you know, just passing through and someone just made a passing comment to you and it hurt you and it hurt you in a way that you didn't think it could ever hurt you. And it was just this flippant comment. In the same way, sometimes we as a community make flippant comments of love. 
flippant actions of care. Just, oh, hey, you know what? I you know, sitting around with this gift card of, you know, I know this Tim Hortons card has about probably five bucks on it. Hey, how about I give this to you? I don't think I'm going to use it. Someone could just pass by and do that. And you never know how that might bless someone. Someone could just be like, oh man, I actually was really just craving that, that vanilla dip donut. I was thinking about it for the last little bit and it's been on my mind. And, and then all of a sudden they blessed you with this. I am not asking for a vanilla dip donut. Sure. <laughs> or Lucky Charms. Just giving you the example, just flippantly. Now, if we're willing to just allow Christ to work in and through us, we can be the promise of peace to someone else. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today and for your, your beauty that's present in your word. And pray as we journey through this, you know, these verses that you impact us with your beauty. And uh, pray that in the ways that you revealed yourself to us today, that you would again help us to remember it. Holy Spirit, bring it back to memory. How do we need to be remembered that you are God who keeps his promise of peace? Reveal it to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message and it blessed you as we discover more about this great life we have in Jesus. I want to encourage you to, to like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also you can check out these videos here and watch more sermons and more messages. It really will encourage you in the, the joy and the power that we have in Jesus Christ.